All right, to begin with today, open your Bible to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. We have brought two messages here recently up on the title, What Really Happened in the Book of Acts. That's been a book that's been debated for many years as to what was really going on in that book. And this is the third one. And I pointed out so far that in the book of Acts, the apostles preached and taught about the church that Jesus said he would build. In the four gospels, he said he would build it. And in the book of Acts, they built it. And in the four gospels, Jesus Christ proclaimed, the Bible says, a great salvation. And in the book of Acts, they preached that great salvation. As a matter of fact, there's a pamphlet on the back table that describes how great that salvation is. Now today we're going to look at Acts chapter 1. And in verse 1, 2, and 3 it says, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he had through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You notice that before Jesus went back to heaven, he spent forty days teaching the apostles about the kingdom of God. Now, Luke says, right here in Acts chapter 1, we pointed out before, that what Jesus began both to do and teach in person, He continued to do and teach to the apostles that He had chosen. Luke wrote the book of Luke and Acts. In the book of Luke, He tells us what Jesus began both to do and teach in person. In Acts, he tells us what he continued to do and teach through the apostles that he had chosen. So what should we expect to find in the book of Acts? Well, what's found in the book of Acts is a continuation of what Jesus began both to do and teach in the four Gospels. What the Lord began to do and teach in person, the apostles continued to do and preach throughout the book of Acts, which was a period of about 30 years. Now we learn right here that one thing, the Lord preached in person was the kingdom of God. After his resurrection and before he went back to heaven, it says he spent 40 days teaching the apostles about the kingdom of God, according to verse 3. Wouldn't you love to have been there in that 40 days? What did he preach about the kingdom of God? How did he define it? If we know that we can know what the apostles believed and preached about the kingdom of God, because they simply continued to preach what the Lord preached and taught them, and if he taught them about the kingdom of God, then that's what they preached. We need to find out what they believed about that kingdom and what they preached about it. Now turn your Bible to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Right here we find the very beginning of Christ's ministry. The very beginning of it. He was baptized by John the Baptist. He went into the wilderness 40 days. And he came out and began his ministry. And in Mark 1.14, it says, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. 
Now this is the very beginning of Christ's ministry. And the first words out of his mouth were, The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, it says in verse 14 and verse 15, 15 especially, the Lord said, The time is fulfilled. The time was fulfilled for him to show up and begin his ministry. Now that time that he's talking about there or mentioned was the time for him as the Messiah to appear and begin his ministry in fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. That's what he's talking about when he said the time is fulfilled. Now back there in Daniel chapter 9, we're not going to go. I'm just going to summarize it quickly because we don't want to get bogged down in prophecy this morning. That's not the point of the message. In Daniel chapter 9, the nation of Israel has been in bondage in Babylon for 70 years. And Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, is praying and weeping over their spiritual and moral condition. He's praying and weeping over their iniquities and their sins and transgressions. You read that in verse 1 through 20 of Daniel 9. He's also weeping and crying and praying about the condition of the city of Jerusalem and the temple. At that time, the city and the temple lay in ruins. And so the angel appears to Daniel. And I'm just paraphrasing what the angel said. The angel said, Daniel, got some good news for you. The city and the temple are going to be rebuilt. The angel told him that God was going to raise up a man, and that man's name was Cyrus, Media Persia, and he said that that man, who was a Gentile, by the way, is going to give a commandment, a decree for the Jews in captivity to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city and the temple. And the angel told Daniel that once that decree goes forth, once he writes the decree and gives that command, he says, Daniel... Here's something else that's going to happen. 483 years later, Messiah the Prince is going to show up and he's going to take care of the iniquity problem you have, the sin problem you have, and the transgression problem you have. And the way he's going to take care of it, make an end of sins, and make reconciliation for iniquity is by being cut off in death. So, back there in the Old Testament, Cyrus gave a decree, wrote it down, go back, rebuild the city, rebuild the temple. From the time that that decree was given until Messiah the Prince showed up, 483 years were fulfilled. And that's what the Lord is talking about right here when he said the time is fulfilled. And folks, that time, I can tell you what I believe about when it was fulfilled, when it came to pass, when the 483 years were up, is recorded in John chapter 1. We won't read it. Read it on your own. One of the great chapters in John. In that one chapter alone, Jesus Christ is called the Messiah of Israel for the very first time. He's called the Lamb of God. He is called the Son of God. And he's called the King of Israel. All in one chapter. John 1. That was the fulfillment of Daniel 9. That's when the time was fulfilled. That's when Messiah the Prince showed up. And that's what the Lord's talking about here. The time is fulfilled. The time was fulfilled for him to show up and begin his ministry 
as Messiah the Prince. Okay. The second thing he said here in Mark 1, 15, he said the kingdom of God is at hand. You see that in verse 15? The kingdom of God is at hand. Now these are the first words that came out of his mouth when he began his ministry. First words right here. Now what does at hand mean? He said the kingdom of God is at hand. What does that mean? Well, that's important because it shows you what kingdom he preached. It defines the kingdom of God that Jesus preached when you realize what the word at hand means. Keep your hand here in Mark 1 and look at Matthew 26. And notice how the word at hand is used in these verses. Matthew 26. Here in Matthew 26, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane just hours before His death and He's praying. You're familiar with this story. And uh, the apostles are out there with Him and what do they do instead of praying? They all go to sleep, don't they? Matthew 26, 45. Then cometh He to His disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. Underline those words. At hand. And the Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, here it is. He is at hand. That doth depray, depray, betray me. And while... He yet spake these words. While he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, hold him fast. Now, folks, when the Lord said, He is at hand that doth betray me, the man that betrayed him was standing right there. Judas. In fact, Judas was there before the Lord got the words out of his mouth. So the words at hand mean something or someone is here now and not the future. Is here right now. That's what the word at hand means. Therefore, when the Lord said that the kingdom of God is at hand, he means it was there when he spoke those words. If so, was it a literal, physical, visible kingdom that changed the earth? Obviously not. Obviously not. Look in Luke 17. Here is the kingdom of God that Jesus preached that was at hand then and there. Luke 17, 20. Luke 17, 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, see, they're expecting something physical there, you see, the Pharisees. He answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo, here, lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, folks, that's the kingdom of God that Jesus said was at hand. It was not a literal, physical, visible, earthly kingdom. It could not be seen or observed with the eye or touched with the hand. It was not in a certain geographical location like low here or low there. He said the kingdom of God is within people. It's within you, he said. So it's obviously a spiritual kingdom, is it not? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Turn to Matthew, if you would, chapter 12. Matthew 12. (coughs) 
Matthew 12, 22. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, how shall then his kingdom stand? Notice that. Underline that in your Bible. The devil has a kingdom. How shall his kingdom, the devil's kingdom, stand? Verse 27, And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. Now watch this next verse. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his goods? Now look what the Lord said in verse 28. He said, the kingdom of God is come unto you. He did not say, if you repent, it will come to you. He said, it is come unto you, present tense, whether you repent or not. It was there, the very moment he spoke those words, and the proof the kingdom of God was there, is when he cast out devils by the Spirit of God. That was a sign that the kingdom of God was present. Now, I want you to notice something else here. That when Jesus cast out devils by the Spirit of God, it says he was spoiling the goods of a strong man's house by binding the strong man of the house. You see in verse 28, that if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is coming to you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his goods. That word spoil. No, that word spoil in that verse means to plunder, to strip, to seize someone of his goods and possessions. It means to seize someone's goods and possessions. Well, folks, the strong man is the devil. No doubt about it. His house, in the context, is his kingdom. His goods are the people he holds captive in his kingdom. When the kingdom of God came, Christ the king began to steal and seize and spoil the kingdom of the devil by casting the devils out of the captives in his kingdom. He rescued them from Satan's kingdom by casting Satan out of them and then put them into the kingdom of God. And to spoil his goods, Jesus said he had to bind the devil. How did he bind the devil? Number one, by the power of the Spirit of God, according to verse 28 of Matthew 12. And number two, by the gospel that he preached, according to Mark 1, 14. The Spirit and the gospel. This is not something that will happen in the future. It was happening then and there. He bound the strong man, seized his goods, and put his goods, his people, into his kingdom. Folks, what happened in the four Gospels, what happened in Acts, was that the kingdom of God invaded the kingdom of Satan and Jesus the king bound the devil and seized his captives 
and made his captives his children. Today, the kingdom of God still invades the kingdom of Satan to seize his captives and make them members of the kingdom of God. What Jesus began to preach in person, the apostles continued to preach in Acts, and you know what? It still continues today. That war between these two kingdoms, God's kingdom, Satan's kingdom, continues today. Jesus, when he showed up, bound the strong man, the devil. Not literally, he bound him by the power of the Spirit of God and by the gospel. And by doing so, he seized his captives, freed them, and put them into the kingdom of God. Look, if you would, to Acts 26. This verse shows you it continues today. Acts 26. Acts 26. Now, Paul is rehearsing his conversion on the road to Damascus, right? Here in Acts 26. And the Lord spoke to Paul that day when he saved him. Said a lot of things to him. But look at Acts 26, 17. Deliver thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and something else, from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now, folks, you know what these verses are telling us? They not only apply to Paul, they apply to us. These verses tell us today, Christians, that we can deliver men from the power of Satan unto God. But wait a minute, how do we turn men today from the power of Satan unto God? The same way Jesus did it. By binding the strong man. How do we bind the strong man? What does that mean? That word bind has many meanings. And there are two of them that fit these verses. It means to restrain someone in any manner. And it means to constrain someone by powerful influence, force, or persuasion. Let me say that again. It means to restrain someone, and it means to constrain someone by powerful influence, force, and persuasion. Okay, in order for us to bind and restrain the strong man to deliver his captives from his power and his kingdom into the kingdom of God, we've got to have a force stronger than the strong man to do it. And there are two forces in the world today that can restrain and bind the devil, and they are the Holy Spirit and the gospel, and we've got them both. Look at 1 John chapter 4 in your Bible. 1 John 4. First John chapter 4, verse 3. He said, In every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Well, that will be a satanic spirit. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Well, the spirit of Antichrist is the spirit of Satan. Where have you have heard that it should come, even now already is it in the world, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Overcome who? Them. What's that? The spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Satan in verse 3. Well, how do we overcome them? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In other words, we have someone inside of us that's greater than the spirit of Satan and the spirit of Antichrist, and we overcome that spirit by the person that's in us. Who is it? Verse 13. Here it is. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, 
and He in us, because He hath given us of His Spirit. There it is. You see, folks, Jesus Christ bound Satan, the strong man. He restrained him. He constrained him by the power of God's Spirit to spoil and seize his goods. So do the apostles in the book of Acts and us today because that Spirit dwells in us and greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world than the strong man. In other words, the Spirit of God is much stronger than the strong man, the devil. And the Spirit of God lives inside of you. And by the power of that Spirit, you too can spoil the strong man's goods. You can bind the strong man by the devil. By, by, the, by the Holy Spirit of God, I should say. And then the second thing that we have that overcomes and binds the strong man is the gospel itself. In Romans 1, I'll quote the verse to you. He said in 16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He said the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Salvation includes saving and delivering men from the power and kingdom of Satan into God's kingdom. To do that, the strong man has to be bound, and the gospel can do it. Why? Because, folks, the gospel is more powerful than the devil, the strong man. Now, here's what I'm saying to you. The kingdom of God came when Jesus came. And it invaded the kingdom of Satan and it bound and restrained the strong man by the gospel and by the Spirit of God and spoiled his goods. It delivered Satan's captives from his power and translated them into the God's kingdom. That invasion that Jesus started continued in the book of Acts during the ministry of the apostles. You know, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus sent the apostles out. He said, go preach the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Right? Now, think about this. When the twelve apostles and Paul preached the gospel by the power of the Spirit of God in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into all the Gentile nations of the earth, the kingdom of God invaded those cities and those nations. And by the power of God's Holy Spirit and by preaching the gospel, those apostles bound the strong man, spoiled his goods. They delivered thousands of men and women, boys and girls, from the power of Satan and his kingdom into God and his kingdom. And folks, today, the kingdom of God is still invading Satan's kingdom and is still spoiling his goods. Folks, what happened in the book of Acts continues today. Jesus Christ declared war on Satan and the apostles joined him in the fight. And we should join the fight too to spoil the strong man of his goods. We have two forces that can seize and spoil the captives of the strong man and translate them into the glorious kingdom of God. And those two forces are the Holy Spirit of God and the gospel, the gospel of Christ. Folks, the Holy Spirit and the gospel are greater in power, greater in power than Satan, the strong man. And you know what? For 2,000 years now, the gospel and the Holy Spirit have seized and spoiled the captives of the strong man and translated them into the glorious kingdom of God that's within us. It happened in Acts. Matthew, Mark, and John is going on today. You and I are in a warfare. It's Satan's kingdom against God and our job by the power of God's Spirit and by the gospel is to seize 
the captives of Satan and deliver them into God's kingdom. And that's what happens when someone gets saved. Now, let me say this. At the same time that Jesus Christ preached that spiritual kingdom of God, He spoke of a literal, physical, visible kingdom of God as well. Yes. But you know what He said about it? He said it's going to be a long time before it comes. It's not at hand like the spiritual. Uh, Look at Matthew 25. Matthew 25. We'll try to make this simple right here. Matthew 25, 14. Matthew 25, 14, 15. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Now, there's another, if you look at Matthew or, or look at Mark and Luke, it says this man right here that went into the far country, it says he went there to receive for himself a kingdom. Okay, that's Jesus. It's obviously Jesus Christ. He's the man that went into a far country. But before Jesus went back to the far country, back into heaven, he gave, ta- he gave talents unto certain people, like the apostles, maybe like you. And down in verse 19, it says, After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh, second coming, and reckoneth with them. See that? So here's the man traveling into a far country. That's Jesus. Went back to heaven. Before he goes back, he gives out talents, gifts to certain men. And after a long time, he comes again, second coming. And when he does, read the rest of the chapter, he reckons with these men. He judges them according to what they did with the talents he gave them. But the point I'm making is that it was says he, he comes again after a long time. See that? See, this kingdom, the literal, physical, visible kingdom, it's a long time off. But in Matthew 12, that when the Lord said, is at hand. He said, it is come unto you. So you see, one is future tense, and the other is present tense, and we should divide them, separate them, keep them separated. Now listen, folks, there is, as you know, a literal, physical, visible, earthly kingdom coming in the future. It will fill the earth. All things will become new. But it was not at hand. And Jesus Christ did not offer a literal, physical, visible, earthly kingdom to Israel, and neither did the apostles. The kingdom Jesus and the apostles preached was there, and is still here today. The literal, physical, visible kingdom is far off in the future and could not have possibly come in the book of Acts or even after Acts. No way possible for that kingdom to have come in Acts or after Acts. Now, You know why I say that? Because the general consensus of many dispensationalists is that there was a possibility that Christ could have set up his literal, physical, visible kingdom in the book of Acts if Israel would have only repented at the preaching of the apostles. And most people believe today that that kingdom was postponed due to Israel's unbelief. Well, that theory about the kingdom is like many theories. It's been repeated so many times and for so many years that people assume, well, it must be true. But folks, when you put that theory to the test of the Scriptures, it does not stand. That theory is wrong, totally wrong for a number of reasons. You see, the problem with people today, many dispensationalists and fundamentalists, is that they're like the Pharisees. 
When Jesus preached about the kingdom of God, they think physical. See? But Jesus, the kingdom He preached was at hand. It was right there when He was here. Obviously a spiritual kingdom. And you must divide between the two. One is at hand, here now, the others are far off. And I want to say once again that this idea that the kingdom, the literal kingdom could come in Acts is wrong. And let me give you three quick reasons why you know it's wrong. Number one, the apostles never ever preached that if the Jews repented, that Jesus would have come back and set up his literal, physical, visible kingdom. If you read the book of Acts, there's not one occasion where the apostles told anybody that if they repented, that Jesus would have come back and set up a literal kingdom. They preached faith and repentance for the remission of sins, and they preached a new birth to get into the spiritual kingdom that was already there. Secondly, the coming of the literal, physical, visible earthly kingdom is not dependent upon the repentance of anybody. As a matter of fact, when the kingdom comes, the Bible says that this world will be in a state of anarchy and only a small group of people will believe in that day. Not only that, when that literal, physical, visible, earthly kingdom comes, you know how it's going to come? It ain't going to slip up on people. Daniel 2 says it will come by war and violence and bloodshed and destruction. That's how it's going to come. So this idea that the kingdom of God it would have come is dependent upon Israel's repentance is totally wrong. Totally wrong. And thirdly, Folks, the people of Israel did repent at the preaching of the apostles. See, people today say, well, the reason why Jesus didn't set up that literal, physical, visible earthly kingdom is because Israel did not believe they didn't repent. They believed the, quote, kingdom was, quote, postponed uh, due to Israel's unbelief. That is not true. The fact is, in the book of Acts, we've seen it many times, the Jews repented and believed by the thousands. By the thousands. In Acts 2 and Acts 4, which is just a matter of days, 8,000 people in a matter of days repented and believed. And then later on, thousands of others. Now think about it. If that literal, physical, visible earthly kingdom would have come if Israel would have repented. Why didn't it come? Thousands of Jews repented of the preaching of the twelve apostles. So if what people say is true, then Jesus should have come back and set up His kingdom. But even though thousands repented, Jesus Christ did not return. He did not return. Now, there are a lot of other reasons scriptural reasons and prophecies that the prophets and Jesus gave that precede the coming kingdom of God. And none of those prophecies came to pass in the book of Acts. You know, one time Jesus said that Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed, didn't he? When did that happen? 70 A.D. Was it possible for Jesus to come back and set up his kingdom prior to 70 A.D. when the Lord said Jerusalem and the temple are going to be destroyed? No way possible. No way possible. That's not all. In Luke 21, you know what Jesus told the apostles? He says, I'm going to read it to you. He said, they say lay hands on you and persecute you, deliver you up to the synagogues and the prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my sake, and you shall be betrayed, both by parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. That's what the apostles expected to happen to them in the 
<coughs> excuse me, in the book of Acts. They were not expecting a literal, physical, visible kingdom to come. They were expecting persecution and even death to come, and that's exactly the way it worked out. Every apostle ended up murdered except for maybe John. They were persecuted all the way through. They did not expect some kingdom to come. It wasn't coming. And one other thing quickly. Jesus told Peter one time, he said, Peter, you're going to grow old and die. Didn't he? Now, when Peter stood up and preached all the way through the book of Acts during his time, do you think he expected the kingdom to come during his lifetime? No, he didn't. The Lord said, you're going to grow old and die. Do you think the kingdom could have come as long as he was alive? No way. And you know what? There's a long list of other things. I won't deal with them here this morning. A long list of prophecies that must be fulfilled before the kingdom of God in its literal form ever comes. But listen, the kingdom of God came in its spiritual form in Jesus' day. It was there in the book of Acts and it's here today. You know how I know it's here today? We'll look at one verse and close. Colossians. Look at this verse. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Paul said to us Christians who had delivered us from the power of darkness, that's Satan's kingdom, by the way, and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. There it is. You're in the kingdom today. It's obviously not a literal, physical, visible kingdom, is it? No way. This world's a wreck. When that little one comes, then the world will become like the Garden of Eden all over again. We live in a wreck today. But yet there's a kingdom here, the kingdom of God. And today, the kingdom of God is in a battle against the kingdom of Satan. And Jesus and the apostles and us, we have the power to bind the strong man, the devil, and seize the captives in his kingdom and transfer them, translate them into God's kingdom of light. That's what we're doing right now. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So that's that spiritual warfare we're involved in in Ephesians. That's what it's all about. Two kingdoms clashing against each other. The devil trying to seize lost people Drag them off into his... Well, they're already there. All lost people in Satan's kingdom already. The real battle is for us to seize the devil's captives and bring them over into God's kingdom. And the next verse tells you how is through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's by the gospel. That's what happens when someone gets saved. When you got saved, God took you out of Satan's kingdom, the power of darkness, and he translated you into his kingdom, the kingdom of light. Jesus started that ministry. It continues today and will continue all the way out throughout eternity. Thank God. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say today. And just keep in mind that when the Lord said the kingdom of God is at hand, he was not talking about some physical thing. He said, if you see me cast out devils by the spirit of God, you know. The kingdom of God is come unto you, present tense. is here right now. Let us pray. God, we thank you you have translated us out of Satan's kingdom into your kingdom today, a kingdom of light, a kingdom of joy and happiness. We have a lot to look forward to, but God, during our time, may we make every, every effort to do what Jesus and the apostles did to bind the strong man by the Spirit of God, by the gospel, and seize his captives and bring them into God's kingdom. That's your will today, and God help us get busy and do your will. In Jesus' name, amen.